So, good, good afternoon everyone. I hope you're enjoying your pizza. Uh, my name is Sheila Coronel. I work over at the other building, Pulitzer Hall, at the Journalism School. But I'm very pleased to be here this afternoon to talk about disinformation. Uh, for most of us, that wasn't a thing until 2016 when the election of, well, Rodrigo Duterte in the Philippines and Donald Trump in the United States uh, exposed us to a whole new world of uh, digital, uh, digital black ops, you know, troll armies, fake news, fake news sites, etc. Um, we're very pleased to have with us today Jonathan Corpus Ong, who's done a lot of work on disinformation production, what he calls disinformation production. If you've been reading a lot of the things that have been coming out about disinformation, a lot of it is looking at tracing the networks of Twitter bots and fake news accounts, etc. etc. Jonathan takes a different look, uh, has a different way of looking at the disinformation ecosystem, which we'll talk about. It's a, um, it's a very interesting and insightful way of trying to plumb the reasons why people do this, who are the people working on this disinformation forums, their moral justifications they have for doing their work, and the whole complexity of trying to correct or check the excesses of this new disinformation landscape that we find ourselves in. So Jonathan is Associate Professor uh, for Global Digital Media at, Un at the University of Massachusetts in Amherst. His work has focused mainly on the ethics of media, especially the moral and social consequences of media and communications technologies, on the everyday lives of vulnerable populations and communities, especially in the Global South. He is founder and convener of the Newton Tech for Development, Tech for Dev, which is a global network of academics and technology studying emerging media in low and middle income countries. Um, Jonathan did a year's field work looking at troll farms, whatever you call them, I don't know how accurate that is, uh, or the fake news production <coughs> cycle in the Philippines. And I think his work provides us insights on the new landscape we're in and is useful also in thinking about uh, how we understand this new space. So, Jonathan, please. Uh, thank, uh, thank you so much, uh, Sheila, for the introduction and thanks so much everyone uh, for coming. Thanks for having me. I'm in Communication and Media Studies and so I'm um, being hosted by an East Asian uh, Studies in uh, Institute and having um, questions from Southeast Asian um, experts here um, would be a very welcome uh, treat for me. Um, so steering um, discussions away from being so tech-centric uh, tech um, and <coughs> expanding it uh, to talk about histories, ecologies, um, and systems um, would be um, how I approach uh, fake news production. And, and hopefully um, we'll have a good um, discussion today. Um, so what I wanted to discuss um, with you today uh, would be the wicked problems of fake news and how it continues to evolve, to adapt, to mutate, and continue to affect um, the Can region's largest. Bit, okay. uh, the region's uh, largest democracies, holding national elections between now and the end of May. So on one hand, fake news and hate speech continue to be problems. So from mob violence organized via WhatsApp in India to other ethnically and religiously charged uh, fake news in Indonesia. But on the other hand, what we're seeing is also fake news solutions, so-called solutions and interventions, are becoming problems in themselves. So Indonesian fake news laws have been criticized for overreaching. Um, where ordinary people have been locked up simply for sharing fake content on Facebook. Um, in the Philippines, public hearings have named and shamed digital influencers, so high-profile celebrity figures who would be circulating fake news content, but um, I would argue the real masterminds of digital campaigns have gotten away scot-free. So across the region, face, uh, Facebook also has enlisted the labor of local partners to do third-party fact-checking. But are these arrangements sincerely aiming to enhance democratic deliberation? Or are they di displayed as bright and shiny branding instruments seeking to uh, rehabilitate the image of the company? So these are the questions that I want to work uh, through with you tonight. What happens when so-called solutions have concealing effects um, that would divert us from the roots of the problem? 
what happens when interventions um, introduce new incentives that would help uh, that would herd us academics journalists and the public to target only low-hanging fruits while the true masterminds get away while the underlying structure that makes all this possible is still in fact reinforced and kept in place so I'll be taking you th uh, through some of my uh, previous uh, research in the Philippines. Um, as Sheila has said, I interviewed um, the actual uh, fake news authors and the, the people, the high-level strategists, down to um, lower-level fake account operators. Um, I did this study together with uh, my co-author, Jason Cabanez, um, who's associate professor in the Philippines in De La Salle University. So, um, as a back, just as a background uh, for um, uh, uh, for uh, most of you, I'm an ethnographer, and I try to study how ordinary people make use of media. Um, some of my previous work has been on digital work and digital labor, and so that's how we kind of approached fake news and and political trolling. So we were. Um, we came from this perspective, can we try to understand what the work arrangements are in the political trolling industry? So before we discuss them as these exceptional villains, let's understand them first as workers and what are the work incentives uh, that would um, make this profitable, uh, that would incentivize um, this kind of production of disinformation. So um, a year ago, uh, we produced a report called Architects of Network Disinformation. And its key questions were, who exactly are these um, uh, political trolls? What are their work backgrounds? Where do they come from? And uh, crucially, how do these folks sleep at night? <laughs> so um, we uh, conducted interviews um, in the aftermath of the 2016 elections. As Sheila said, um, this was um, where uh, the May 2016 elections catapulted populist authoritarian Rodrigo Duterte to the presidency after a savvy campaign that mixed the shock value of his profanity-laced speeches with the firepower of vociferous social media influencers that amplified his message of anger against the elite establishment. And Facebook itself calls the Philippines as patient zero in the fight against digital disinformation. So we discuss in our report the shadowy professional hierarchy of the political trolling industry, and we try to show how it goes much older and deeper than Duterte and his campaigners. So we argue that we, um, that we need to look at the chief architects of disinformation who continue to put forward respectable faces while hiding in plain sight. So um, our report um, tries to intervene in the um, literature on digital disinformation in these um, key ways. So first, um, um, recasting um, the fake news author uh, from the exceptional villain to ordinary digital workers. And so uh, uh, approaching paid trolls as ordinary workers um, would help us think about the industry codes of practice and economic incentives that normalize and reward these jobs. Um, the second um, shift was to look at um, electoral events um, and try to decenter the exceptional event of elections um, to see how it's rooted in everyday political engagement and everyday political expressions. So we were trying to see how um, a popular culture um, and, and everyday kinds of engagement and expression in social media might become weaponized for politics might become activated during the exceptional event of the elections. So trying to see the roots um, um, of some of these expressions in the everyday. Um, so another um, shift is from fetishizing new platforms to, to understanding media as environment. So, um, quite a number of studies, um, including um, in, in Oxford Internet Institute, would um, confer um, a, a lot of focus on particular platforms and would, would study, for example, bots or YouTube as a platform and how it might um, contribute to radicalizing effects or how it might circulate um, uh, disinformation. But we try to look at media as environment and how fake news and, di and disinformation might actually travel and, and their aims are to travel from one platform to another. So li uh, uh, linking new digital platforms also with older historical forms of, um, of uh, disinformation and mass deception. 
Um, the fourth move that we make in our report is to shift the focus from content regulation to process regulation. So many of the current dis uh, discussions try to think about how to fact check fake news once it's already out there. Um, and that's a very difficult and impossible task of how to identify or moderate hate speech once it's already out there. So many of the policy lobbying and our policy recommendations in our project um, was trying to promote transparency and accountability in the process of political campaigning. So we were trying to, 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 uh, to discuss how political advertising and public relations um, within, um, within the Philippines um, uh, um, uh, specifically might try to uphold more transparency and accountability. So some of the um, recommendations that we outlined were could we actually name the firms, the people who are responsible for digital political operations and have a public discussion about some of these, uh, uh, some of these issues. Um, and there have been some shifts um, in the local Philippine Commission on Elections um, to disclose, uh, to compel politicians um, currently to disclose social media funding and also the involvement of PR firms. And we welcome some of those kinds of initiatives. Um, th those haven't been in place um, prior to this current uh, midterm elections. So um, also just as a background, um, some of the conceptual inspirations that we have in our work um, is Arlie Hochschild's work, um, Strangers um, in Their Own Land. So trying to think about um, the populist, um, um, uh, the roots of populism, how, how people justify their own engagement, um, how do they express um, um, uh, identification with Duterte and, and, and his anger and resentment at the uh, at the elite establishment. So how might these kinds of populist roots take, um, take hold within online communities, right? So what we did was um, to conduct uh, 12 months of field research. So I conducted this uh, with Jason Cabanas, and we had a local research assistant, uh, Pamela Combinido, who was based in the Philippines um, during this entire uh, period. So this started from de uh, December of 2016 for one um, whole year. And we did interviews with digital political campaigners down to their lower level staff. So we started with people who um, identified themselves as being consultants for political campaigns and then asked them for referrals to, to the influencers and lower level staff members in their campaigns. And as we went down the hierarchy, it was more difficult um, to get people to, uh, to disclose and to participate in these um, interviews. So we guaranteed uh, folks um, anonymity um, just because of the very sensitive nature um, um, of, yeah, uh, of the interview and also all the discussions around um, uh, paid trolling and political trolling. Um, and so um, we purposely uh, dis uh, identified some information <coughs> as it relates to specific campaigns. We also included an element of digital ethnography in our research uh, where um, we look at uh, Facebook groups um, and different kinds of Facebook communities either associated with Duterte, but we went uh, beyond just Duterte, but also looked at local level campaigns, which we think is also quite missing in some of the reporting around political tro uh, uh, trolling. So uh, campaigns for lower level positions, like for mayor, um, and, and for gov like for uh, for for Congress, um, so from national down to the local level, we were monitoring some of those Facebook communities as well, and trying to see whether they would be seeding particular kinds of content and divisive kind of content in these um, uh, spaces. So. Um, we invite you to uh, download our, our report on newtontechfordev.com. Um, and so this is our main argument. Um, we coined the term network disinformation to refer to the organized production of political deception that would distribute labor to a hierarchy of digital workers. And so, um, and it would have uh, different components. So the first is that it has professional roots in advertising and public relations, particularly um, in the Philippines. 
So in the Philippines, our political system is personality rather than party-based. And so the role of campaigners in enhancing the brand of politicians is much more significant. Um, there's very little ideological differentiation um, uh, from, from different uh, 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 figures and parties and so what's um, important here is to craft this image of either um, Duterte as the strongman figure or trying to to craft an, um, a competing image of a compassionate kind of mother figure for example so those are ways in which politicians would be differentiating themselves <clears throat> so what we learn is that advertising and PR strategists lead some of these campaigns and they transpose tried and te uh, tested techniques in corporate marketing into digital political marketing. Um, the, the second uh, feature of this network disinformation architecture is that these are project-based and sideline jobs. So nobody was a full-time troll, right? Like everyone had a respectable day job either in marketing or they're working as administrative staff of politicians. Some were working in call centers, so they always had their, um, their respectable um, uh, uh, day job, and they would be taking th this on as finite, short-term uh, project arrangements. Um, different teams were also hired by one politician, so um, with some of the most sophisticated and, um, uh, campaigns, one politician would be working with different kinds of firms, and there's an element of one-upsmanship among these different firms which would mean that while there's an overall strategy to craft and they agree on a certain image of a politician, how this um, uh, message is executed and translated by different teams would be unpredictable. And so we call this in our report a kind of volatile virality that would happen. So um, even though the message might not start from a very toxic or divisive kind of origin, as it translates down the hierarchy, it becomes so much more unpredictable as it's executed by, uh, by people on the ground. So, um, crucially, um, because the architecture is like this, um, it has roots in corporate marketing, it's project-based, and sideline jobs um, in terms of arrangements, this would enable moral displacement. So what we found was that workers were very easily uh, 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 enabled to sidestep any kind of accountability. They're able to pass on the blame onto others. So nobody's a full-time troll. They can always say it's somebody else who's the bigger villain in this narrative. So um, here's one of the infographics um, that we had um, in our report um, trying to illustrate the hierarchy. Um, and as, um, as it goes down this, this line, um, communicating it down to the public. So the, poli uh, the political uh, clients will be mainly interfacing with the chief architects of disinformation, and these are ad and PR executives. And they will be responsible for recruiting and leading the entire disinformation team. So it's up to them to assemble a set of influencers uh, and key opinion leaders and also fake account operators that would suit a particular project. Um, these um, strategies would be uh, paid an overall um, consultancy fee and manage the overall project budget. And what we found was that um, because of their respectable faces um, in corporate marketing, they, um, they're, uh, they're empowered to kind of like lend um, a level of professionalism when they would be pitching their services to political clients. So, um, and here's an, expert, uh, an excerpt from our report. So meeting with us in her uh, luxury apartment in the heart of Manila's business district, advertising executive Dex recounted to us how she recruits clients by asserting respectability and using neutralized language when she would meet with politicians. So she said, especially if the client is a bit naive, I don't share all the gory details. I tell them, I just need you to cover salaries for my team of digital support workers and I'll return you with a media valuation report after the project. 
So um, through the course of the interview, we found out that digital support workers is only her term for paid trolls. <laughs> and of course, a media valuation report is a collection of reach and engagement metrics captured by industry standard data capture tools. So um, in terms of moral justifications then, so these people draw from cultural scripts from Western entertainment. So for example, 44-year-old PR strategist Grace compared herself to the popular Game of Thrones character Olena Tyrell. Mm -hmm. who invisibly orchestrated the death of a king in the hit HBO TV show. So other people, so she said, other people like taking credit for trending this, campaign that, but not with me. I like working from the shadows. You know, like Olena Terrell. Nobody <laughs> needs to know it was me. <laughs> so we interpret these as ways of blocking feelings of real involvement and avoiding the real consequences of their action. So some of these people, um, um, see themselves as de facto pioneers in their field. Um, there's a level of entrepreneurialism at play here, seeing themselves as disruptors. A and many want to actually take credit for their work. So the people at the top were the ones most open to us as academics. And there's an element of kind of like credit grabbing for some of the campaigns that circulated um, in the aftermath of the elections. Um, and as you went down the hierarchy, there was more um, of embarrassment and shame um, in getting people to disclose some of these, um, uh, uh, some of their stories. Jonathan, maybe it would be good to clarify, like these are like the top advertising and PR companies mm -hmm. in the country. Some of them linked mm -hmm. to multinational mm -hmm. advertising and PR mm -hmm. companies, yeah. right? Yeah, um, so what we found was that uh, some of these are uh, in those multinationals, but some of the most um, toxic um, and most, in a way, flexible kinds of campaigns were operated by the boutique PR firms. So those um, who are much more agile and there's less um, um, self-regulation -re uh, even within the company about the kinds of clients that they're able to take in. So at the mid-level of the hierarchy um, were digital influencers. And it's important to distinguish between the key opinion leaders um, the kind of like celebrity endorsers and there's a lot of focus on on figures like Mocha Usan for those of you who might know um, who are affiliated with um, the, the president and so there's that's one kind of influencer we focused more on the anonymous digital influencers and they are people who operate multiple pseudonymous accounts and they're responsible for engineering virality so think of like meme pages humorous pages um, pop culture kind of uh, pages or parody accounts on Twitter or Facebook. And then um, they have very organic following, they have very funny uh, content, se seemingly um, on-brand content, and at a certain point they would be seeding political content in these kinds of pages. Sometimes they would be seeding a particular hashtag, making sure that it gets um, uh, retweeted by their followers, and their, uh, their aim here is to hack at attention. So their aim here is to make sure they trend on Twitter so that it would influence and would be picked up by mainstream media. And that's a, that's a kind of game here that they want to make it to the headline in mainstream media, ultimately. So um, we say in our report that um, influencers master the popular vernacular. These people are able to speak the language of the masses. They speak gutter language, street language, snarky gay humor, which is actually quite mainstream humor. They make sure also that visuals look quite gritty and amateurish. So if it would look too professional or too polished, then it would be actually, that would make it less authentic. That would make it more like a campaign. So it's more about trying to find ways to appeal to the masses. Um, and their moral justification here is that they tend to be hired to do the same thing for a shampoo brand or for a soft drink brand. So they would tell us, you know, we're only just doing the same techniques here for a, po for a political client. 
So at the lowest level would be um, what we call the community level fake account operators. And the reason we use community here is that their aim is to infiltrate existing Facebook groups and like real organic Facebook communities and they would be seeding content here. Um, we use the term illusions of engagement. So what, um, what their main aim is to um, be the first people to comment on um, uh, particular kinds of posts. They're the f first people to retweet um, or to engage with influencers and the content that they do. Um, their main aim is to amplify the reach and engagement of an existing post of those influencers. Excuse me. Do they? Kn I'm sorry. It's okay yeah. to ask a question. Go ahead. Um, do they know the influencers? Like, are they told to do this, or is it like a treasure hunt trying to find the influencer? So um, there's no um, direct communication line uh -huh. uh, typically between the influencer and the fake account operators. Mm -hmm. um, there's they don't work in the same office. It's a very dispersed kind of uh -huh. arrangement. Um, but they would be able to identify like a a resonant message mm -hmm. that would be consistent with the aims of that particular team. So they, they don't get told specifically, like, push this hashtag? So, um, so the hashtags would be, uh, would be set by the influencer. There, um, it's up to the community level fake account operator to identify whether this, is, this person is part of our broader network okay. um, without having a very direct relationship with that influencer. It's not somebody that they would be messaging um, on, on, like, yeah, uh, on another kind of communication platform. Um, There's another question over there. Okay. That's a quick yeah. clarification. So is the, everything paid by the, um, the politician or do they get their fees from advertising or something at this lower level? Uh, that's a very good question. So at some, um, so most of the um, most of the account in our report would be uh, paid for by the politician as part of an overall uh, project budget. Um, but at this level as well, those who operate websites that actually derive revenue from ad tech and from ad technology, um, there would be they would be at this level as well. So um, we in. We had some examples of those, but the, they were they were the main bulk of our of the people that we actually interviewed in our, in our project. Mm -hmm. Yes, awesome. for the ad agency executives or the PR mm -hmm. heads, are they like generally when they bring in this like uh, politicians as clients mm -hmm. internally, it's known to everyone that oh we have this ex politician working with us or within just, within the company. Within the you company. Mean. So uh, some of it is very discreet. Um, so some companies have very explicit rules against taking on political clients, particularly from the multinationals. Um, so some um, would not disclose it um, um, to everybody officially. People would kind of know about some of these arrangements that are happening off books. Um, but within the, uh, within the smaller boutique PR firms who, are, who have less restrictions around this, uh, for, for them it would be yeah, knowledge for everybody in that in that team. Mm -hmm. um, so just to just to finish with the slide, um, so here um, we talk about this as a disinformation interface, this kind of dotted line that would separate um, the paid workers and the grassroots intermediaries. These would be the fan page uh, moderators, and these are like the fan club heads of politicians, and the broader public at large. So um, what we say here is that it's a very thin line that would separate the paid worker and the, fan, and the fans, the real fans. So the paid workers will tell us that, you know, we, we engineer, we create some of these very divisive memes or um, engineer trending hashtags, but we ultimately depend on the real fans to take it forward. And that's sometimes when some of the most vile messaging, um, some of the most misogynistic um, uh, messaging and hate speech would actually be coming from the real fans rather than the paid workers. So the paid workers will justify to us of some of their work to, to say, you know, it's actually the real people who are doing it. We're not. We're only seeding the message. We're only creating some of um, this content, but it's the fans who are taking it forward in the vilest way possible, as a way to kind of detach and distance themselves from the real um, 
uh, most hateful kind of messaging. Um, so, so in this um, in this slide, I'll show you. Um, so, we've continued our project. So that was um, from the mostly reflecting back on the 2016 election. We still continue to monitor some of the pages um, um, that we've continued to follow. Um, and this is very new um, examples that refer to the um, 2019 elections that's about to happen in May. Um, where we found a Filipino flat earth Facebook group would be seeding political content that would be pro-Duterte and anti-opposition. So um, this is a group that is actually growing in size as well as momentum. And just like in the US, right, fringe conspiracy theories uh, such as flat earth are, tur are turbocharged in the current populist political moment where attacks against scientific experts and media institutions are spread by both fake news influencers and prominent political figures. So our deep dive into the Filipino flat earth Facebook community uncovers how Facebook, how this Facebook group was weaponized to spread political uh, propaganda. So we observed a pattern here in how the Facebook moderators of this group um, would be seeding political content, promoting the Duterte and this party. Um, in between organic com community discussions, a flat earth theory, and also friendly greetings and friendly socialities. So the admins would be inviting members actually to greet each other Happy New Year or Happy Valentine's Day. Um, and they would be um, inviting them to take selfies. And we interpret that as a kind of uh, authenticating mechanism. So it's like um, a, a post a selfie, greet each other Happy New Year. Where are you in the country? Um, that's, so it's, it's a way to foster community be, uh, belonging. And then in between some of these kinds of messages, they will be um, seeding uh, this kind of um, content where um, this is used as a perfect example of blame gaming instead of fi finding solutions. These are politicians that are associated with the opposition. So yes. at this level, mm -hmm. these are the paid or these are the unpaid? So we interpret this as the Facebook um, uh, moderators here are, are paid um, uh, influencers. So looking at the, uh, looking at the actual accounts, um, they look very suspicious in terms of how they look. Um, it, it looks like they're using different kinds of images, not very authentic kind of um, uh, images. They also follow um, certain groups that are and, and certain pages that are associated with Duterte and also other kinds of meme pages that, that would be operating within this logic. Um, where it's not about flat earth theory, but it would be like um, pop Filipino pop culture, and then it would be the same logic of it's like pop culture content, and then there's political content. Are they being ironic about flat earth theory? No, or not at all. Okay. I didn't know. In this country. I don't know. Okay. Yeah. So it so it's also growing in number. Um, we've been tracking the number um, of this group, and it's growing in size. Um, and momentum um, also with like influencers that have come out recently supporting flat earth theory. And of course there's resonances there with, with populist communication, right? And how it attacks the credibility of scientific institutions and, and the media at large. So, yes? So, so the Facebook moderators, um, so not, uh, we have suspicion that they're being paid. So in this particular case, so the, uh, the actions that the Facebook um, ad, um, group moderators look very similar to what we have seen in the previous campaigns, where it's like seeding a particular content in between organic discussions and looking at how they craft and brand their account in terms of their visuals, what kinds of other groups they follow and what other groups they maintain. It looks very similar. So, um, so it would be looking. Uh, so it would be difficult to know which company is actually working um, um, on this. But but there's a very specific slant in terms of which um, political groups and which political camp they're supporting and which political camp they're attacking. And this would be the pro Duterte and anti opposition um, uh, content that they're spreading. Here.
So um, I'll just end with two slides about interventions. Um, and here uh, we can see, um, so broadening, uh, broadening um, out from the Philippines um, example to think about Southeast Asian <coughs> interventions. Um, you have um, content regulation, um, and here attempts to take down content um, as um, um, advanced in Singapore and Indonesia. Um, in Indonesia, there's also further punishment of the bad actors who would be circulating uh, fake news. Uh, from the platform um, itself, there was a, uh, an attempt at experimentation. In the Cambodian <coughs> example, um, with, their with their algorithmic tweak to downvote independent news and vloggers in Cambodia. And of course, like in a very tightly regulated media e uh, ecosystem, independent media would have a very important voice. Right? And, and that's one way in which, um, and I interpret this as attention regulation rather than content regulation. Um, there's attempts at transparency and accountability, and I'm mo most sympathetic to these kinds of attempts. So in terms of political advertising transparency, you can, you can know who the people are who paid um, for those ads and the logics of micro-targeting for particular ads. So this was rolled out in Brazil and Canada, but interestingly enough, not yet rolled out in Indonesia and the Philippines. There's no real explanation why, um, and it's a discussion perhaps for the room to take forward. Um, I've been doing more um, investigation um, and I've been very curious about how digital labor and digital work would happen, um, particularly in the third party fact checking um, arrangements that Facebook um, has uh, put forward. And they've enlisted the labor of, of journalists um, and media watchdogs in different countries. So they partnered with six local partners in Indonesia, three partners in the Philippines to do third party fact checking work. So I had interviewed um, several fact check partners in the Philippines um, and, and asked them about um, how, how is it working with Facebook. So, and, I, and I've argued that um, th there seems to be very skewed incentive structures at place here that would be targeting low hanging fruits. So apparently uh, Facebook would be paying uh, third party fact checkers $700 for 10 to 14 articles a, a month um, but the terms of what constitutes um, a rumor and a fact check um, is, very, is very strict um, uh, for Facebook. So here, they are incentivizing these third-party fact checkers to go after online rumors, but not really the lies from a politician themselves. So, they're, um, so they would, um, they would uh, pay out the third-party fact-checkers for fact-checking celebrity death hoaxes. Uh, they would be uh, uh, paying them out for obviously fake stories of a Guinness Book of World Records account that Duterte is the best president. <laughs> <laughs> um, but they won't be paying them for saying that um, Amy Marcos um, is faking her degree from Princeton or from <laughs> the University of the Philippines, which is a more crucial um, uh, claim, right? And so there's also very real labor that goes into fact checking here. Um, there's real effort um, of these journalists to look at not just fact checking um, statements, but also visuals. Um, and they talked about the, the very difficult attempt to identify the source of particular visuals and how it is decontextualized um, uh, from the actual event um, and transposed to other events. Um, and there's a resignation to the pointlessness of this particular <coughs> task. And so I'm a bit um, quite skeptical, but also um, 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 hopeful yeah, around third party fact checking. And I hope that it becomes more expansive in terms of its approach. But having said all that, myself and academics Nicole Corato and Rob, Ross Tapsell, uh, colleagues in, in the University of the Philippines, are partnering with CNN Philipp in the Philippines uh, for the elections. Um, Raymond Ang here is from CNN Philippines. Um, and we're trying to also look at disinformation tracking to catch online bad actors, as well as politicians' false claims for the elections. So just to conclude um, here um, and for our discussion, um, we suggest it, um, that our understanding of fake news should go beyond Western-centric lenses and take a global and comparative approach to disinformation production. So understanding local contexts 
of disinformation production and interventions would allow us to deploy more specific and nuanced critique on the interventions that should be pri uh, prioritized for specific country contexts. In our production studies approach would, de would demand that we spotlight the mechanisms that would uh, prevent this kind of fake news and disinformation to be produced in the first place. And this can be done by encouraging open discussion and transparency in, um, initiatives. So I think there's attempts um, in the Philippines to actually foster back channel and subaltern lobbying with big tech, um, where journalists and also academics um, have a, a kind of like back channel communication line with Facebook and their public policy officer who's very sympathetic to catch bad actors to take down websites and, and ban bad actors from the platform. But um, so um, Facebook, um, uh, Facebook's uh, public policy director is very open and sincere um, in her efforts around this. Uh, but I would also want that to be a more transparent um, undertaking. So, so there's discussions like between me and um, my uh, other academic colleagues with them. Um, and, and sometimes they would be very open to, to solicit um, um, advice from us. It's like, uh, give us the names of, of people you want us to take down. And I, and I would also be very much hesitant around that because um, I would want that to be a more transparent and collective and inclusive discussion. Um, at the same time, in terms of industry and academic partnerships, um, there's new um, ways in which big tech uh, fund, uh, funds projects to, uh, to study WhatsApp, study Instagram, and disinformation in these platforms. But I think that there needs to be a real discussion around these kinds of new undertaking, uh, undertakings between the academia and the industry. So I'll end there, and I hope that um, we have a good discussion.